because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Let's jump in. I announced two weeks ago we would have uh, Steve Coonan, the physicist who made a lot of waves with his book Unsettled, back to talk about the response to uh, that book. So uh, yeah, I want to jump right in. Steve, welcome back to Power Hour. Great. It's great to be talking with you again, Alex. We had a great conversation last time and I expect it will be the same this time. All right. Yeah. uh, Likewise, very eager. So Let's start off with, there's been some negative feedback, but I'm first curious about what has been the positive response to the book? I saw it sold a ton of copies, but I'm curious how you've experienced it. Yeah. So the sales have exceeded any expectation that I or the publisher or the agent had uh, when we started. And I think a lot of that is evidenced by the unsolicited feedback I've got through email and conversations with many technical people who aren't climate scientists, but are physical scientists, earth scientists, uh, engineers, who all say, wow, thanks for writing that. Uh, It gives us a framework to think about the problem and some of the information that goes into that framework. You know, if I can compare it to other books that have tried to describe the climate science discussion to non-experts, I think I've gone into more depth and have been more balanced and open than many of the others have. Without getting into specific names, can you elaborate on on what you mean by that in terms of balanced and in particular open? Um, You know, you you don't see, if you take the latest uh, IPCC report, you don't see a graph of the rate of sea level rise in that report at all. They just say, well, the last three decades have been going up pretty rapidly. But in fact, when you look at the whole graph, it's there in the research literature, and I cover it in my book, there are lots of ups and downs over multi-decadal scales over the last century that, again, uh, give one pause to say, hey, this is all anthropogenic. Yeah, and I want to I want to talk a bunch about the IPCC, but um, so in terms of, uh, have you gotten any response from elected officials about the book? Um, not at the national level. There are a number of local officials who um, have said, wow, this really helps me think about the problem, which I think is what my greatest contribution is, is to help people think about it. Uh, I have gotten responses from some climate scientists. Some of them uh, have partly said, Steve, you got most of it right. Uh, There was a review in one of the AGU journals that said pretty much that, although they take issue. American Geophysical Union, right? Yes, American Geophysical Union. They take issue. uh, Nadir Jirji. Jerejeva, um, he, he takes issue with my lack of confidence in the models, but okay, we can have that discussion. Um, so, uh, you know, others have, um, to my disappointment, largely been silent. Uh, and I'm hoping to be out and about at various university events this coming fall, some of them are already scheduled, where I'll be able to engage with credentialed folks who might not agree with what I've written. And I look forward to those discussions. Are any of them, so are most of these you speaking and then there's an audience? Or are there any that are like discussions, panels, there, there, or debates? There's one where there will be an interlocutor, actually two, will there be an interlocutor who uh, probably doesn't agree with me. Can you say who that is or where no, that is? Let me not, I, I, because they've not been announced publicly yet, but they are set. Uh, I, I don't think I should. Okay. The empty announcement. So, okay. and but you are so just to so understand. So, you are open to these things. You're happy Absolutely. to have discussions. Absolutely. As I write in the book, I said, you know, I'm open to substantial informed criticisms, and there's been precious little of that to date. So, this is um, this is a really interesting thing. I think um, I had this experience with my book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. You know, it's just a very kind of popular book and it was a bestseller um, and, you know, it was on the New York Times bestseller list. So like they were aware of it, they didn't review it. But the most interesting thing to me was that it was almost no one actually responded to it. They mostly just tried to uh, ignore it. But I, w- I was thinking with Unsettled, it got so much attention, particularly in the Wall Street Journal, that it wouldn't be uh, ignored. But you're saying it is still mostly by people? And, well, certainly by the scientists uh, in the New York. So there were two opinion pieces in the Washington Post over the last several months, one by Mark Thiessen and one by um, George Will. Um, and uh, 
the comments, of course, were interesting in the Washington Post. Uh, but New York Times, CNN, not a word. I didn't make the New York Times bestseller list, even though I probably sold multiple times the number of copies that uh, uh, some of the other books on that list have sold. That's so, that's what that's really weird because yeah, you were that, at the very t- you got way higher on Amazon than I ever did. Yeah. So and, high and, there. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and the sales are still going fine. Uh, as I said, we've sold many more copies uh, than we had imagined we would. So, you know, what's with the New York Times? Why won't they have a factual discussion of what's actually in the reports? Um, so let's, before we get into the reports, let's talk about Scientific American, because that is a prominent publication. And I think they had two uh, two negative things about it. There was kind of a, a book review type thing, but then I think the most prominent thing was written by a bunch of scientists or scientific commentators, at least uh, Michael Mann and Andrew Dessler are climate scientists of sorts, and then Oreskes is something. Um, yeah, well, so tell us about what, you know, what they said and then what you thought of that and then how you responded. And, and uh, you know, I, I, much of that article was ad hominem attacks, was not science. There were three scientific points that they made. And frankly, I can't remember exactly what they were, but I did write a piece on, uh, of course, I, I did write a re- rebuttal to those three criticisms. Um, and I think I effectively rebutted them. It's the usual thing that they think I said one thing when I actually said something else. Um, I, well, can I can I just read a couple paragraphs yeah, yeah, from, what you, from what you yeah. wrote? Yes, please. Please refresh my memory. <laughs> it's okay. okay. I understand it's putting you on the spot to do it. But uh, yeah, so, um, you know, the beginning, I think this is important. What you just said, like most of that article is 1,000 words. First of all, 1,000 words, not very much. I don't know how long the book is, but it's probably around 100,000 words. Yeah. Um, yeah. So are scurrilous ad hominem and guilt by association aspersions from the 12 co-authors? So they're using a bunch of their real estate for that. That's Alex's comment. Only three scientific criticisms are buried within their spluttering. Here's my response to each of them. And so the, the first one is, uh, the first criticism concerns rising temperatures. A recent Washington Post column by conservative contributor Mark Thiessen repeats several points Steve Koonin makes. The first is citing the 2017 National Climate Assessment to downplay rising temperatures, but the report's very first key finding on the topic says temperatures have risen rapidly since 1979 and are the warmest in 1,500 years. So that was the first one. Yeah. So, you know, what I talk about in the book is not the rising average temperature, which is what they're talking about, but I talk about the incidence of daily record high temperatures across the U.S. and low temperatures. Completely different temperature metric. So they're they're dodging the question, if you like. Yeah, and it's also interesting that they're responding to you by responding to a column about you. (laughs) As you know, when you write about climate and energy, people pay attention to every adjective and word that you say. And so to get quoted secondhand, as you like, uh, is just, it's lousy scholarship. And those people, because, you know, they're faculty at credible universities, you would think that they would do better. I'm disappointed. Um, And then there is, let's see. The second is Thiessen quoting Kunin's use of an outdated 2014 assessment on hurricanes to downplay climate concerns, but the newer 2017 report finds that human activity has, quote, contributed to the observed upward trend in North Atlantic hurricane activity since the 1970s. Yeah, so so this is an active uh, uh, area of research. What I actually quote in the book is not just the uh, assessment report, but a 2019 paper by 11 hurricane experts who found no detectable trend in hurricanes, except for some small thing going on in the Northwest Pacific. Uh, With respect to the upward trend in North Atlantic over the last four decades, uh, there was a paper in 2020, which I quote, that found an upward trend. But then there was another paper that just came out a few months ago that said, no, this is likely part of natural variability and be very cautious about interpreting that upward trend. So I would say that that issue is still unsettled. Um, And then the third one is, uh, this is the quote, a third point downplay sea level rise by portraying it as steady over time, cherry picking reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In fact, the rate of sea level rise has quadrupled 
since the Industrial Revolution, as climate scientists pointed out years ago when Kunin made this same argument. That is so disingenuous. When you look at the actual data in the research reports, although not in the assessments, we've seen the rate of sea level rise go through a maximum around 1930 or 1940, a minimum around 1970, and now it's on the rise again. This obscuration of variability in prior decades and focusing only on what happens in the last decade is a characteristic tactic of people who want to disguise what the real data are. And again, I'm surprised and embarrassed that people of that alleged quality would not uh, make those points. Yeah, also, I mean, it's, I don't think it's accurate that you portray it as steady over time. Quite the opposite. In, in, in fact, I have graphs that say it's varying a lot and just don't focus on the last three decades. So, it, I, you know, I wonder if they read the book. And if they did read the book, they're just being dishonest. I mean, I would bet a lot of money that most of the people did not read the book. It's very weird. I mean, can you imagine engaging an author, a book, and, and referring to a Washington Post column about the book in two of your, I think, in two of the three criticisms? Yes. And also, as you may know, there was a fact check early on that um, people did. And at least one of the fact checkers has admitted to me that they hadn't read the book at all. The fact checker hadn't? Correct. Uh, was there any? OK, so then um, so you've given your responses here, and this is very similar, uh, expectedly, to what you published or you wrote an open letter rather. So what was your experience with Scientific American? Uh, in well, terms of responding? Yeah, I submitted it to Scientific American and uh, they said, no, we'll pass. No, no comment other than that. You know, is that, is, is that unusual or do they? I, I, well, I don't know. I've never been in this situation before. What I do know is that there is a consortium of media outlets called Covering Climate Now, and you can find them on the website. And they have basically signed a pledge. People should check it, not check my interpretation, but I believe the essence of it is they've basically signed a pledge to stick with the narrative and not to publish anything that would contravene the narrative. And Scientific American is a prominent member of that consortium. And so I'm just curious, what do they take to be the narrative? Because there are a bunch of, there's a policy narrative. There's like, we need to force everyone to use renewables. There's, yeah, we I, think I, it's a problem. I don't right. know, what's the I, narrative? I'm, I'm not gonna, uh, I don't know exactly, but certainly they believe the IPCC is the gold standard and anything that cast out on IPCC conclusions, they're not gonna discuss. Gotcha. Okay. So they, yeah, they, yeah, that was odd to me that they, I mean, a letter to the editor from a scientist who's been attacked, that just seems very straightforward. Yeah, they, they absolutely refuse to publish it. Okay. So, you know, when I was young, like many people, I read Scientific American cover to cover. Now I, I don't look at it except if they write bad things about me. <laughs> um, do you have any future book books planned? Because that's probably, probably going to be the next time they write about you. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've been uh, mulling over some ideas. I, at some point, it might be appropriate to update Unsettled, mm -hmm. um, be, given the uh, developments that have happened covered in AR6, but also even after AR6 was released, things are still happening. So there might be at some point to do that. I, you know, I, I think the world has probably got too many energy books, um, you know, yours among them. Uh, but there are other aspects of society that I think are important to educate people about our systems more generally, water, waste, um, finance, uh, that people just need a basic literacy about. And so I've been thinking about whether that's worth describing to people. Gotcha. All right, let's jump into the IPCC. And, and uh, I just want to refresh people on our last, we had an interesting discussion about it last time, because what, what I see with IPCC, there's these two threads. So one thread is that the kind of media, not just the media, like the, the public dissemination part of our, what I would call knowledge system. So you can include like the summaries for policymakers, certainly people like Guterres who say like code red for humanity. <laughs> so, so there's this distortion mechanism of the public people distorting what are in, what's in the synthesis reports. And this is something you document, Michael Schellenberger documents this, Bjorn Lombard documents this, and I, I documented it as well. But my, kind of my point to you, and we talked about this last time is I, 
I think that's important, but I also think the IPCC synthesis itself has a lot of distortion mechanisms and it's also subject to political pressure. So what I worry about is that it gets worse and worse. And that's part of my take on AR6 from the parts I've read is like that's happening. So I'm curious of, before we get into how AR6, so assessment report six working group one is what's been released so far. What's your view on how politics has shaped just the report? And then we can talk about the reporting on the report. I think the report, when you read it, clearly demonstrates that it's meant to persuade rather than to inform. And it does that in a variety of ways, truncating the data. In this current report, a lot of verbiage, but not many graphs. Um, And I've not ever been involved in the IPCC process personally, but many others who have tell me that um, it is more a political exercise than a scientific exercise. That isn't to say that the scientific substance of the reports is necessarily wrong, but it's not all correct or complete. So it is misleading often by omission or misrepresentation. So what do you think, what kinds of graphs, you mentioned one, but what kinds of graphs are missing from the report that you would expect to be there in a real survey of the subject? Well, uh, you know, we've already talked about sea level, and let me just say a little bit more about that. Uh, so you can find in the graph, one graph of the rise of sea level itself from the late 19th century up through the present, and uh, tacked onto that, of course, all sorts of projections of dramatic rise. Um, but of course, the text talks not about the sea level itself, but about the rate of sea level rise, which is what is the crucial issue. Our human influence is accelerating that rate. And it says, well, the last three decades uh, have been faster than uh, the 20th century average. And even the last six years, I think it says, from the satellite data are at you know, astoundingly large rates. But if you're going to do that kind of verbal discussion, you want to see a graph of the rates over the last 20th century. It's not anywhere in the IPCC report. And when you do that, and it was there in the last IPCC report in AR5, it's there in my book, it's there in the research literature. When you do that, you say, uh, you know, the last three decades, okay, it's going up, but it was going up just as fast uh, 80 years ago. And so that's the kind of omission of context that gives the non-informed reader the impression that things are, the climate's broken. One of the examples is the hurricanes, right? They go through and you can find in there, there are no trends in the frequency or, um, uh, let's see, well, certainly no trends in the number uh, over the last 80 years or so. Um, But boy, you would have liked to seen a graph for that, to show that. They don't show you that. All they say is that, well, it's likely have strengthened in the last 40 years. Uh, and we think that that's due to human influences. Uh, again, as I said, there's a recent paper that says, well, maybe not. Um, so it's that lack of more detailed scientific information. And I think that's one of the things I've done in the book that has made so many people say, wow, that's interesting. It's to prevent the, present the relevant graphs. And the IPCC doesn't do that, at least not in this report. One, you know, one thing I'm curious on your take on is there's a certain device in these reports where they have low confidence, medium confidence, and, and high confidence. And this to me is a very odd thing because you what you can do is you can say, like if you say something, I don't have it in front of me, but if you say something like, uh, you know, drought has been affected by uh, CO2 emissions, low confidence, that really means there's high confidence that it hasn't been. So what they do is they take everything negative and they attribute it some level of confidence to it to make it seem like a positive versus normally you would talk about, well, we're confident yeah. in the in the opposite with right. that. Right. You, well, you would have said, well, yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> um, it's an interesting device, right? And, you know, I could say I have no confidence that you're an alien. Yeah, uh, exactly. Right? That's a much better example. Yeah. Right. Like and, Alex Epstein uh, is an alien. Low con- right. and, and what it is, is it shows you have a narrative. So the narrative is everything is getting worse. 
because we're doing it. And we just, we can only prove so much of it so far, but there's no yeah. question that we're right about right. it. Right. Yes, right. The, I, you know, I don't know if you ever looked at the story in the early 20th century of NRAs. Um, no, I didn't. And this was covered by a famous paper by Irving Langmuir. Uh, and basically, there was this guy whose name was Blonde or something, I've forgotten his exact name, who kept finding some alleged phenomena. And when other people tried to repeat it, they couldn't. And he said, well, you just have to look harder. And eventually the threshold for detection got lower and lower, but he was absolutely convinced that it was there. Uh, and, it, you know, some of the IPCC report reads a little bit like that. We can't see it now, but it's there. And just you wait. Um, you know, for me, the most, I don't think this would belong in working group one, but for me, the most shocking omission in the reports is that not mentioning the rapid decline in climate related disaster deaths. I mean, to me, that's like a polio report that doesn't mention polio right. vaccination. I mean, that just seems like a to I mean, an obvious kind of bias when you have thousands of pages to work with. Yeah. I, so, you know, Bjorn Lomborg, I think, was one of the first people to put that out in public. And, and he's right. Uh, you know, with respect to hurricanes in particular, we've gotten so much better at predicting hurricanes, where they're going to make landfall. And people have adequate time to uh, get out of the way if they'll listen to the predictions. Of course, that's a, a whole other social question. Uh, but uh, yeah, and you know, the hydrology has gotten better also. Um, the, the floods that we've seen, terrible floods. You used to see tens of thousands of people dying in flood events uh, well before human influences were important. And, and now you see you know, 10, 20 people maybe. Uh, so yes, we have gotten a lot better at protecting people from extreme weather. What, you know, one prominent or semi-prominent change in the new report is what's called equilibrium climate sensitivity. And they've brought that up now. And I forget what it was in one of their, it, historically it's been 1.5 degrees Celsius to 4.5. So that, that's how much warming you get with a doubling cool. uh, of CO2. And so in the past, it, in, at one point they brought it up to the lower range up to two. So it's two to 4.5 and they brought it back down to 1.5. But now it's back and now it's from two to five and with, I think, a high confidence of 2.5 to four. What's your, your take on that? Because my sense is the models have at least a little bit over predicted warming. So why are you why are you concluding, oh, yeah. it's actually so, more sensitive? So, I, you know, I covered the uh, large sensitivities in the current generation of models in the book. And I speculated a little bit, how is AR, well, I'm not speculated, but I questioned, so how are they going to handle this in AR6? And what they did, at least with respect to the sensitivities, were, was to decompose the sensitivities of the models into the different feedback factors, clouds, albedo, lapse rate, and so on. Extract from the models each of those sensitivities add to them observational constraints on the sensitivities, and then them all back together again. So to get the, the new limits. And, you know, that may be not an unreasonable procedure, but it raises a number of questions. Uh, one is, of course, do the models, do the sensitivities just add like that? Are they really additive? The second is the models are supposed to be adding all those sensitivities together, but they get it wrong. And so how come, you know, you've decomposed it, you've added them back together, but the models don't give that answer. Uh, so, and then of course they go on to use the models for regional predictions. So, um, and I think a third is that some of the other constraints they put on the sensitivities, um, having to do with the historical record, people legitimately question whether they've done it right to account for natural variability and so, and so on. So um, I, I would say still unsettled uh, as to what's going on and a little bit questionable procedure that needs to be looked at more closely. Who, who needs to look at it? Well, you know, there are people who publish papers that are kind of dismissed. Judy Curry and Nick Lewis uh, is one of the names I remember. Uh, directly, but there are others as well uh, that, um, that let's see if they're happy with how Sherwood et al., which is the name of the relevant paper, 
cited in the IPCC, uh, handled the, um, the analysis of the historical record. I'm curious, have you seen any cases where you could tell that the IPCC selection of papers was questionable? There's one, and I, I wish I remember the details, but Roger Pilkey Jr. was mentioning something on, I think it was like hurricane, it was some sort of damages thing. And he mentioned there are 43 papers that say one thing and one that says another, and they took the one that said another. Oh, I, 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 there's nothing like that that comes to my mind immediately. But, uh, you know, I, I think Roger does a very careful, incredible job. And uh, if he says that, I would believe it. Again, it's all in service of telling a narrative. Um, has anyone, has any, have you talked to, have any mainstream climate scientists sort of anonymously reached out to you and said, hey, you know, I, I agree with you or this is. Yeah, I, again, I'm not going to. No, 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 I, I understand it's anonymous. It's, I'm not telling there you are, out there, them. There, there are a couple people who have done that. Uh, people I've known uh, for many years uh, who are in the climate business and say, Steve, you got it just about right. Um, um, that, there was another one that the IPCC is kind of interestingly um, silent on, which is the failure of the models to do the mid tropospheric warming in the tropics. And this is one that John Christie has been pushing for a long time. If you look at the rate of warming in the tropics, uh, in the middle of the troposphere, uh, the models predict far more warming than is actually seen. And uh, there's a real issue about why that is. Is there some response by the modelers to that? Well, I didn't, not within the uh, assessment report, but um, uh, within the uh, dialogue in the community, you know, the models would say, well, we got the sea surface temperatures wrong, or uh, we just need to adjust this or this factor and we can reproduce it. Uh, but no real response. Uh, and, you know, there are so many factors or knobs in these models, you can probably make them do anything you want in the end. Um, so. Yes. One thing I don't understand about this claim that, you know, people talk about, quote, the models are, are good or the models aren't, I mean, they have these this incredible divergence of of projections in them, and even with the issue of equilibrium climate sensitivity, I mean, two degrees to five degrees is an absolutely enormous range. So if you take the baseline unamplified greenhouse effect as one degree, you're basically saying, oh, it's amplified either by a factor of two or by a factor of five. I mean, that's yeah. a very wide range. So right. what? How do they people say? Oh, the model. What does it even mean to say the models are right when there's? It's not like they model one thing; they model this enormous divergence of things, and then yeah. they get averaged. Right. Um, hey, you know, if, if to a non-expert, if you mumble big computer model, uh, you uh, achieve a level of credibility that uh, is probably unjustified. Um, you know, another thing about the models is, at least as far as I've been able to read in uh, the most recent report in AO6, and people should know it's about 4,000 pages long, and it's pretty dense, so it takes some time for everybody to go through it. Uh, one of the things they show is how well the models reproduce the current climate patterns, uh, cloudiness, precipitation, temperature, and so on over the globe. And okay, fair enough. But, but what we're not interested in is the current climate pattern. We're interested in how they will change under human and natural influences, which is an entirely different subject. So that if they had reproduced the trends, let's say over the last 50, 70 years, and shown how well for each of the regions you got the trends right, that would be more convincing. Interesting. Um, all right, let's talk. I know you want to talk a little bit about. Oh, uh, let me ask. Did you do you have any thoughts on these attribution studies? Um, this you become know, more prominent in this version yeah, yeah. is, and there's a clear push toward it. Like, oh, there's a fingerprints of X. And yeah. as as a layman, it seems very dubious that they understand that that kind of well, thing with uh, the precision good, they I'm, say. I'm glad that uh, the layman's have that sensitivity uh, or that sensibility because it's in fact true. I mean. Again, uh, my sense is there are so many factors that you can wiggle the analysis one way or the other. I, you know, in the book, I like to say it's like a fortune teller telling you won the lottery after you actually won it, uh, right? And, um, you know, please, if you want to believe this kind of attribution, 
do the attribution prospectively, and then we predict that there will be five times as many tornadoes or whatever. And then let's wait a couple of decades and see if you get it right. Otherwise, it's like reading entrails. It's just, you know, I, I don't know why climate scientists uh, put so much stock in that. And particularly if you read some of the early documents in the field, they say, we're doing this to call, to call attention to it. The other thing I would say is, you know, let's take some benign weather, right? Like the major hurricane drought for, I can't remember, 12 years or something. No hurricane hit the U.S., major hurricane. Uh, can you attribute that to human influences or not? So let's try to attribute some benign things as well as some terrible things. Yeah, I mean, my view is I would I would give much more credibility if they attributed even 10% of good things. Yeah, right. Because if it's exactly. all bad, then it's obviously religious view yeah. that everything and, and, we do is bad. And I think it's a failure of the scientific establishment not to hold these people to a greater standard. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen um, Ross McKittrick, who's a really interesting guy, like the climate okay. economist. Yes. You know, he's been harsh on the methodology and the, the mis, misuse of econometric methods. He's had some good stuff, the attribution studies. And there is a kind of general thing, if you look at the climate science field, where generally people who are experts in specific methodologies will accuse climate scientists of not being expert. This happened with Michael Mann on the hockey stick. So I just recommend that. Look up Ross McKittrick and attribution studies. Yeah. I thought he had a really he, interesting He does criticisms. great stuff. Uh, you know, more generally, and I, I think I mentioned it in the book, and it's not new to me, I think the field would benefit enormously from a greater influx of people with real statistical expertise. Um, Andy Gelman is a, a statistician at Columbia, I know, who has criticized uh, a number of the temperature analyses uh, for using improper statistical methods. Yeah, I think that'd be that'd be amazing if you actually had the best people. Because I think what you get is the interaction you get is really from the professional associations. The professional associations, like obviously the American Physical Society, you were involved with, but it's usually, as far as I can tell, the political people who the political people sign on to these statements. What you'd really want is the stars saying, "Hey, are you really using yeah. these econometric methods properly? Are you really using these statistical methods?" Like that would actually be interesting if they said, "Oh yeah, Michael Mann really nailed it." Right. I, and, and, you know, the, the, government, the government, at least this particular administration, uh, is being um, two-faced about it, right? This is the greatest problem facing humanity, et cetera, et cetera. Yet why aren't they calling in a diversity of outside experts, people not involved in the field, to give a hard scrub to what's being uh, said and written? Um, and they're not doing that. Uh, so that makes me think there's something to hide here. And in, and in fact, you know, I think the current science advisor, Eric Lander, whom I know, though I've not talked to him about this uh, subject, um, he's got a hard time because when you really look at the science as I write in the book, and if you read the assessment reports, it does not align with the political dialogue that we've broken the climate and we've got 15 years to save the world. And so how does he produce something that's credible and at the same time, uh, aligns with, or at least doesn't undermine the political agenda. And I don't know. I think he's got a hard job. Well, also in particular, because I mean, one thing I point out is just as an energy guy, you know, the, the, ob the hostility toward nuclear is just completely contradictory to the claim it's an existential threat. Even, you know, Robert Bryce has really made this point that the opposition to solar and wind by the green movement, even though it's stopping those plans from happening. It's stopping transmission lines and stopping mining and it's certainly stopping the construction of these things. And they don't really seem to care. So it really, it, it has all the flavor of we're just kind of against energy and against industry and we want to stop things. Otherwise you would say they would be terrified about why aren't we building many wind turbines and transmission lines or why aren't we building nuclear power plants? But there's really just a focus on let's get rid of the fossil fuels and then let's have this scientific Justification it doesn't strike me as they're really afraid of it, more as it's a really compelling reason to do things they want to do. But when you look at the administration's plans or the plans of, uh, you know, greener NGOs, you wonder whether anybody really understands the energy system when they write these plans down. Um, we need to, at least according to uh, mainstream climate economics, we need to do this minimizing disruption in the transition, because transition will be disruption, uh, guaranteeing reliability, uh, economics, 
but at the same time, reasonably raining, raising in whatever climate risk there is. And the mainstream economics literature says you should let the temperature rise to maybe three, three and a half degrees, not the one and a half or two degrees that's being discussed in connection with the Paris Accord. So, you know, if they say they're following the science, well, let's really follow the science. And the minimum is go slow, be thoughtful, develop the technology, uh, and let the temperature go up some. Yeah, so I know you had mentioned before we talked that you want to talk about climate economics. Do you have any other broad thoughts about climate economics versus how policymakers and even these public scientists are treating the issue? Yeah. So, so let me elaborate a little bit. And, you know, my thinking on this was started by a paper that McKittrick was a collaborator on who kind of explained it to those of us who were not deeply steeped in the field. Um, and it, it's a notion that William Nordhaus won the Nobel Prize for in 2019, 2018. Uh, and that is the following. If you decarbonize rapidly, you entail all sorts of disruption. Uh, maybe disruption in energy services, disruption in employment, in the economy, and so on. And you incur costs having to put in whatever technologies you've got that are zero emission or low emission. And so you want to do that as slowly as possible. On the other hand, if you take too much time in doing that, the CO2 builds up and the climate risk grows. And so there's clearly an optimum. Uh, that you should, uh, an optimum pace, if you like. And as I mentioned, at least Nordhaus's an an analysis a few years ago said you could let the temperature rise a couple of degrees more than is being discussed uh, to achieve climate uh, optimality if, or economic optimality, if you like. So I guess I'd like to hear some of the people who are in favor of what I would say is precipitate decarbonization uh, uh, to say, well, why are you in such a rush? Uh, the, the second point about climate economics is right there in the assessment reports working group two or the National Climate Assessment volume two. And that is that the net economic impact of even a six degree rise is protected to be a few percent. And you know that's over 80 years. And that few percent over 80 years is not a big deal. It's a couple years worth of growth at the end of the century. And of course, the estimates don't account for adaptation, et cetera. So when I quote that and quote it right out of the reports, people say, well, you know, you haven't worried about tipping points and sudden things that could happen, whether it's permafrost outgassing or the Atlantic circulation slowing down. And well, there was a paper that came out this summer that analyzed eight different tipping points by a set of economists. And they found another one or two percent. So it's still, I would say, minimal. And then finally, people say fat tails, right? Well, what about, you know, very improbable but high consequential events? And again, a paper came out uh, within the last year, I think. No, uh, yeah, within the last year, where they read it an analysis of the economic impacts. And again, they find a few percent with essentially no outliers being above about 6% for a four degree rise. So this is one of the things I just don't understand why it doesn't get more prominence. Economic impacts will be minimal. These will be bumps in the road overall. Now, certain sectors, certain countries will be impacted more than others, but obviously then other sectors and other countries will be benefited because the average is relatively small. So, you know, it's right there. obviously, if you don't have the what I would say is the anti human bias in a lot of these things, that everything we do must be bad. But I think a part of what's going on is so you have these two things, which is sort of how negative is our climate impact going to be at all on its own? There's that. And then there's kind of what's our adaptive or mastery ability. And then there are all these other considerations that you would be harming with different kinds of things. There's all, I mean, to me, this is all just there's so much speculation in all of it. The, the climate part is so speculative. And I don't believe any of these things about like how could you possibly know what the cost of decarbonization is? I think it's effectively without nuclear, I think it's far greater uh, than they think. I mean, we certainly have no known way of doing most of these things without nuclear. And even with nuclear, a lot of these things haven't been developed. So I think I think they tend to overestimate negative climate impacts and, and underestimate economic 
costs. But I think the other side would say, no, you're underestimating the climate impacts. And, and there's a kind of growing movement to say climate economics is a failure. They don't re- like they're OK with five degrees, but f- five degrees would be the end of the world. And I think yeah. that's more of a moral kind of religious yes, perspective. That, right. That rather than a, a hard numbers uh, kind of perspective. But let me just come back again to whether we could really decarbonize the grid, which is something I know you, you think a lot about. Uh, I've s- said, you know, there's a triangle. You can have the grid as reliable, you can have it as low cost, or you can have it as zero emissions. But you can only choose two out of those three. You know, we don't know how to get all three at once. If you want to be economic and reliable, well, we've got coal and gas. If you want to be economic and low emissions, but not reliable, we've got wind and solar. And if you want to be reliable and low emissions, we've got nuclear and CCS. But it's not economic. So, you know, nobody knows and nobody has put forward a plan that satisfies all three of those constraints. And, you know, they wave their hands and say, well, we'll develop the storage technologies. Uh, Not within more than a few decades, I would say. I mean, usually when you're talking about things scaling rapidly, they're they're working at it, they're they're out competing at a very like at a low level, and then you think, oh, this can be scaled. This is you know, you invest in a startup when oh, it can do this thing at lower cost, and it just needs to scale. But with solar and wind, we see right now they're cost adding to these like with in California, New York, and Texas, yeah. and these things. So there's no prototype, that, you know, commercial prototype that's working really well. There are a bunch that are actually having huge problems, like in the UK. And in, I mean, this winter in, in Europe is really rough yeah, because they're yeah, right, restricting gas. I'd like to say that the most expensive part of a green grid is not the generation. It's the reliability. And you pay so much to get that last tenth of a percent of reliability, whether it's an added capacity or in storage or dispatchable power sources. Um, but if you're content with the lights going out, you know, for a few hours every day in the winter, um, green is just fine. Yeah, and I'm sure industry really loves that too. Oh, yeah, if you're right. pursuing a pretty, I mean, this is an interesting thing. There's uh, in the Wall Street Journal, they had a good article by Robert Bryce on just how this company, Generac, the home generator company, is exploding. And what it really points to is how, re- how valuable economically reliability is. I, I've thought about this living in California. If I bought a house in California, I would absolutely need a reliable generator and I would pay a lot of money um, for that, much more than the electricity. I mean, I might pay a hundred years worth of electricity to guarantee the reliability. Now, not right. everyone can can do that, and so it just points to we we take the reliability for granted. So I love that comment about the economics of the reliability. So I have uh, uh, in the house I'm sitting in now. The background behind me, you can see, uh, is north of New York City, and there is a Generac uh, in the house put in by the previous owners and. Uh, it turns on a couple of times a year and runs a fraction of the house. And I'm so grateful that that's there. Uh, my wife more so. Uh, uh, yeah. And there's a home use. I just want to reiterate, there's the home use, but there's the industrial use. I mean, this is something that's really underrated is like how much industry depends on an, on a reliable electricity supply. And particularly we, you know, grids tend to want to punish consumers last. So when we get a blackout, That means things are really going on. Industry gets these quasi blackouts. They're not really blackouts, but they they cut off power to them. And that's the kind of thing that people are going to flee over. And so you just think about your industrial base and and that disappearing. And, 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 you know, you sort of see the system collapsing almost in real time, right? We shut down San Onofre in California. We shut down Indian Point uh, here around New York City. Diablo Canyon in California is going Next would be my guess, uh, and the the nuclear fleet is aging, uh, and we're not doing anything about it. So we saw in Texas the cost of not paying for reliable generation, even if you never use it. Um, and I think the country is unfortunately headed in that direction. So have you have you been? I know you teach. You have this interesting combination of you teach climate and you teach energy. Do any of your plans involve writing? You you said there are more. You said there are enough energy books, which is funny to me because I just finished yesterday my my next energy book called Fossil Future. But I think there are not enough good energy books. Uh, uh, so okay. I'm curious if you're planning on doing more. Yeah. In this so space. so um, I do teach uh, in the uh, fall. I teach climate science, and I just had my first lecture yesterday. 
Uh, and uh, in the spring, I teach energy soup to nuts, fossil renewables, regulation, economics, and so on. And, uh, you know, I could probably do an energy book. It's interesting you say you, you think we need more of them. I think one of the things I did in Unsettled, and, and I set out to make uh, that my contribution, was to make it synthetic and explainable to people. Mm-hmm. And maybe there is a need for that uh, in the energy business. Um, so perhaps, uh, although having been through one book and you know the enormous effort it takes to actually produce a, a quality book, um, I think I need a break for a little bit. Well. Yeah, that's fine. Well, you're, yeah, I was up. I was up. I, I was up till nine a.m. yesterday morning on the last version before it goes to land. So I still have yeah. a little more. But yeah, I'm. I can. I'm going to get in that period where I forget how hard it was how hard the right. last three years were. Right. And then I'll be right. like, oh, I got I can write another one. I just got to it's, it's like having kids, right? You forget how much trouble the first one was and then you go ahead and have the <laughs> second one. <laughs> and some people in this case have 20 of them, like Thomas yeah, Sowell, I, you know, he, yeah, he's got the yeah. best method actually because Thomas Sowell, the way, as, as I understand the way he does it is he just, he never agrees with, he never agrees to, to, to publish anything with a publisher. He just does things and picks them up and puts them down. And then when he has one, he just sends it to the, his agent. He, yeah, he does it on spec, basically, right? Mm. Yeah. You know, in, in this sphere of uh, Vaclav Smil, whom I'm sure you know, um, mm-hmm. is another very prolific book writer. And uh, some of his stuff is just wonderful. And I, I learned a lot from it. Uh, as yeah, I mean, that is, the guy is yeah. very prolific. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. All right, Steve, well, we're going to wrap up. Um, where can, so be, obviously people can buy Unsettled. I forget, is there any other way to follow you? Or so you to can follow me, uh, you, you know, I, I put up some things on Medium. And, mm. uh, oh, I didn't know that. Look, uh, yeah, at the, the response to the Scientific American article and um, uh, the to the fact checkers is up there on Medium. Uh, I have an intention to put some more things up there. We just had, I mean, uh, you know, not quite uh, or a real research contribution to climate science. As you may know, uh, we've been watching the moon now for 20 some odd years to learn about the Earth's albedo. And we just published a kind of capstone paper for that project, 20 years of observations. Mm. Interestingly, we see a slight decline in the Earth's albedo over those 20 years, uh, climatologically significant on the order of half a watt per square meter. And interestingly, the Irby guys with the satellites, uh, much more precise, but also much more expensive, uh, see something similar. So the recent warming may be as much a consequence of the loss of cloud cover as it is um, uh, greenhouse gases. So albedo is the reflectivity, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, okay. So, you know, the climate is very sensitive to the reflectivity. I mean, its average is 0.30. If we're, we're 0.29, the Earth absorbs a little bit more, that would be equivalent to the effect of all the CO2 that we're talking about. Gotcha. And is there any way, um, I know people sometimes reach out to me and say, hey, I want Steve to speak. So you can certainly do that and I'll put you in touch with them. But any, any way people can reach out to you to speak? Uh, yeah, so I'm represented by the Stern Strategy Group. Oh, uh, terrific. Stern, and so Stern Speakers, you Google that. Uh, or you can just send me an email at my NYU address, stephen.coonan at nyu.edu. And uh, I'll forward that on to the uh, 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 Stern folks. All right, Steve. Well, great to talk to you again. Uh, congratulations on the success of the book. And I'm Thank really you. looking forward to these debates. And yeah. so please let me know as they occur and I'll, I'll publicize them to my I, uh, I, audience. I will indeed. Okay. Very good. All right. Good to see That's, you. Uh, great to Take chat. care. Thanks again to Steve Coonan for joining me. Uh, it's my second conversation with him, period. I have never talked to him outside this podcast, but really enjoyable. I hope you enjoyed it as well. I really like how he's He's good at identifying what he knows and doesn't know and just doesn't just armchair when he'll say, oh, I don't know, or I don't have an opinion about that. So I was, whenever people do that, I have a a higher opinion of them and their confidence in what they actually say uh, they know. But more broadly, it's just very enjoyable to talk to him. Uh, I've heard from him a little bit after about just some of the specifics that may be happening. And it's very exciting, and it should be in the next couple months. In the next couple months, we should be getting some really interesting uh, interactions between him and some catastrophist types, or at least people with very different views than he has. And th- that's very heartening to see that people are doing it. I think it's one one great thing about having him uh, in this uh, talking about this issue is he's got you know credentials, and he's a physicist, and he's well respected in academia. So I think that 
enables him to get people to engage who might not otherwise engage. So I'm just, uh, that's, that's really good news. So I will be promoting that. And maybe at some point after these debates, uh, he'll agree to come on again and we can discuss what we've learned from those. A few other wrap up things. So make sure to check out energytalkingpoints.com and share it. It right now has a, it now has a search function that's really cool. I use it quite a bit. So just any topic you can think of, just type in and it'll immediately bring up all the talking points that I've done uh, on that topic. Also make sure to follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash Alex Epstein. I'm writing a lot there these days. And if you're not already on my email list, go to alexepsteinlist.com or you can sign up as well at energytalkingpoints.com. Uh, There's something else that I am now uh, forgetting, which I may, I may remember when I do my usual uh, wrap up. Oh yeah, if you want to become uh, an accelerator, go to industrialprogress.com. Accelerate, this is helping fund our research and development and our promotional efforts. So I just on Monday, so I'm recording this on Tuesday, Monday morning, I think 9.16 a.m., I sent the latest version of my manuscript to the publisher. This was quite a uh, quite an, another like 30-day effort of straight work. So I'd, I'm I, hopefully in the future, I'm going to plan these books so it's not this intense. But I'm very happy with how it's turned out. It's now going to layout. So there's limited ability to edit it. Uh, I can still make kind of small edits, but it, you know most of the hard work is done and I'm very excited for you to see it. So thanks to all the accelerators who helped finance this project. And then the accelerators will also help promote it in a number of ways. So again, industrialprogress.com slash accelerate. All right. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, you can email me at alex at alexepstein.com. And let me just see what else. Oh, well, if you're know if you listening to this or watching this on, um, if you're listening to this on podcast platform, watching this on YouTube, try leaving a rating and a review. I very rarely ask about that, but I think those are very valuable things that can get this, uh, the content of the show, the ideas of the show to a broader audience. Right. That is it for this week. Thanks again to Steve Kudin, and I'll be back in another two weeks. Until then, I'm, Al- I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.